This morning our presentation is entitled, The Church, the Body of, of Christ. In our presentation this morning, we want to talk about the church, and we want to uh, talk about uh, the body of Christ, but also there's a third topic that we want to discuss as well, and that is the topic of salvation. Actually, all three topics, the church, the body of Christ, and salvation, all three topics are inseparable. All three topics are, are one. Actually, we can't have one without the other. One cannot uh, be saved without being a part of the church. One cannot find salvation without being in the body of, of Christ. And we'll notice these things as our sermon unfolds this morning. So we want to preach on the church, the Lord's church, the church that he promised to establish in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, the church that he established in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. We want to preach concerning his church. We want to notice how that his church is clearly through scriptures. His church is his body, the body of, of Christ, and that and that salvation is only found in his body. Salvation is only found in his church. One cannot be saved. One cannot be saved outside of his church. One cannot find salvation outside of his body. Our presentation this morning is designed to be very, very simplistic. Very, very easy. Let's begin like this. For about 2,000 years, men and women have asked a very, very, very important question through the ages, and that is, what must I do to be saved, or what must we do to be saved? The topic of salvation has been on the mind of honest hearts for 2,000 years. A very good question. And as we look at that question, it's a single question. The sad thing is, though, through the ages, the sad thing is, though, that man has come along and has provided religious individuals, radio preachers, TV preachers, denominational preachers, various men have come along, and they have shared their thoughts, their ideas, to this single question, what must I do to be saved? And the point here is, they have come up with several different answers. One question, <clears throat> one question, but they have provided to their flocks, they have provided to their radio listeners, they have provided to their TV viewers, and so on and so forth, many different answers. Many different answers. And I want to preach this morning how that there's one question, what must I do to be saved? And according to the New Testament, there's only one answer. Only one, one answer. In Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, and also we find in chapter 16, verse 25, the exact same language. In Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, the writer here says, There is a way which seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Now, when it comes to this topic here this morning, this overall topic of how to be saved, how to be saved, we want to make sure everyone, all of us in the room, myself, everyone on this globe, we want to make sure that we are not following a way that seems to be right. Because the writer here says twice over, there's a way which seems to be right unto us, unto man. But the end thereof are the ways of death. And so the point here is, when it comes to what folks think about how they are saved, when it comes to what folks think about even the church and so on and so forth, and I realize this is very, very elementary and, and basic, you know, 
Well, we want to make sure that we're following a path, a way that we know is correct, that we know is right, and not a way that just appears to be right, that just, according to our feelings, our emotions, our own minds, our own thoughts, just a way that that seems to be. It just feels good. You know, we don't want to be individuals wherein, for example, someone might ask us or someone might ask another individual, are you saved? And they say, in reply, they say something like, well, sure I'm saved. And then the individual says, well, how do you know you're saved? And the individual might come back and say, well, I know I'm saved because, well, you know, I, um, some time back, I just had this, this feeling come over me. And since then, it's just, I just have this feeling that feels right, you know. The point here is, again, there's a way which seems to be, to be right, and there's a way which is right, and they are vastly different, night and day different. There's a way which appears to be right, that seems to be right, that may feel right to our human emotions and think so's, and then there's a way, according to the scriptures, that is right. And we want to today look at that way, that path, that plan that is right, and not that path that just seems to be. Maybe kind of, sort of, you know, seems to be, be right. Jeremiah said a long time ago in Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 23, Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 23, Jeremiah said, O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. So when it comes to this topic or any other Bible matter, we have to understand that God's thoughts, you know, the scriptures, God's thoughts aren't always our thoughts and vice, vice versa. And we find here that Jeremiah said a long time ago at the end of the verse, it is not in man that walketh to direct his own steps. And again, going back to what I said at the start, you know, there's one question, and the question is, the one question is, what must we or I do to be saved? But again, sadly, as we look around about us, there are multiple answers, and there shouldn't be. One question, one answer. One question, one answer. These multiple answers that men have come up with Well, it reminds us of the end of this verse, Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 23. It is not in man that walketh to direct his own steps. And that's what they are endeavoring to do when they come up with all of these different answers in regard to salvation. They are endeavoring to direct their own steps. Direct their own own steps. Well, now let's look at um, the church to begin with, the church, the body of, of Christ. To begin with, in this portion of our sermon, I want to, according to the scriptures, and if you would like, turn now to the book of Colossians. Turn to chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1. And in this portion of the presentation, I want to, using the scriptures, I want to prove that the church is the body of Christ, and vice versa. The body of Christ is the church. And I'll be leading up to something here as I progress. I'll be leading up to how that this all has to do with our eternal salvation in Jesus, Jesus Christ. But step one, you might say, or our first main point here this morning is to prove according to the scriptures that the church is the body, the body of, of Jesus Christ. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 18, we find that the Apostle Paul says this, and he is the head of the body, comma, the church. And that's all I want to look at here in this verse at this time. Very simplistic. I said a few moments ago that this sermon is designed to be very easy, 
nothing hard, nothing challenging, very simplistic. Paul says here, and he is, and he has reference to Christ, of course, when he uses the term or the word he, and he is the head of the body, comma, the church. What's he saying here? Two things. He's talking about how that Christ is the head of the church, and that's another subject. But he's also identifying the fact that the church is the body, and the body is the church. He says, the body, comma, the church. Christ is the head of his church. Christ is the head of the church that he established and that was brought into fruition there on the day of Pentecost, approximately A.D. 33, the church, comma, the body. Move down to some of the same chapter, Colossians chapter 1. Move down to verse 23 and 20, 24. Colossians chapter 1, primarily verse 24, but we'll read verse 23 as well. Colossians chapter 1, verse 23, highlighting verse 24. If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature, which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Now look at this. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his, here it is, for his body's sake, comma, which is the church. Now, we can't get any more simpler or simplistic than that. I mean, the passage, really, Colossians chapter 1, verse 24, explains itself. And our first point here, our main point to begin with today is this. The church, now we're talking about the Lord's church now. We're not talking about denominations, which again is another topic within itself. We're talking about the church that Jesus promised to establish, promised to build, according to Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, the church that was established and that was started, and the birthday of the church is found in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1 slash chapter 2. That church, the Lord's church, his church, Paul says in verse 24, Colossians chapter 1, his church is his body. The Lord's church, and this is important, I mean so important for folks to understand, and we'll see why in point number two here in just a few moments. But folks have to understand this. They must. They must know this. They must understand this. I want to read, and then I'll move on to point number two. I want to read again Colossians chapter 1, verse 24, slowly, especially the end of the verse, verse 24. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, comma, which is the church. So it's clear, number one, that the church is the body of Christ, and the body of Christ is the church. Now, secondly, why is that so important? Turn, if you would like, to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, and I'll point out why it's so important. I mean, this is, this is mandatory. This is a must that every human soul on this globe understand. Point number one. Every human soul must understand, as they're seeking salvation, and they want to be saved now, Everyone must know first. They must understand. If they want to be saved eternally and want to be saved according to the scriptures and not a way which seems to be right and not following a path that is their own think-sos and so on and so forth, they must know 
and understand, like we just read here, it's not my thoughts, my opinions, etc. Paul said it, inspired by the Holy Spirit, the church, which is, he said, which is the body, which is the church. The church, which is the body. Vice versa. Either way, the same thing. Why is that so important? Because we want to notice here next that salvation is only found in the body of Christ. For one to be saved, they must be in the body of Christ. For one to be saved, they must be in the church of Christ. And what I want to emphasize here in point number two is that salvation, again, trying to make this as simple as and as easy as possible, salvation is only found in the church. Salvation is only found in the body of Jesus Christ. Now notice Ephesians chapter 5, then Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 23. We find prior to this verse, as everyone knows, the Apostle Paul was talking about um, the coalition, the relationship between uh, husband and wife, and uh, paralleling that to the relationship that we have with Christ, with the body of Christ, the church. And he mentions here in verse 23 this, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23, for the, hus for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And then he says, and he is the Savior of the body. Notice that. I mean, again, that is so simplistic, so, so easy. We can't miss this. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Now, looking at this, particular point so far as the first portion of the verse, when religious folks per se read that, why they can walk away, so to speak, from that verse with an understanding. For example, okay, so you open your Bible and you say to them lovingly, gently, and kindly, explain to me this verse, please. And you might say to them, okay, first explain the first portion of it, and then explain the second portion of it. And so they say, okay. And so they read, okay, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And they would say to us, well, that just simply means, just like Christ is the head of his church, the husband is the head of his wife, and vice versa. My point here is, they catch that. They understand that. They know that. Why, who would, who would debate that? Who would say, no, that's not what it says, really, or that's not what it means, really. They understand the first portion of the verse, which is simplistic and very, very easy, this parallel that the Apostle Paul was inspired to make directly by the Holy Spirit. But what about the second portion of the verse? And he, Christ, and he is the Savior of the body. Okay, what does that mean, friend? What does that mean? Could they explain what that, that means? It simply means that salvation is only found in the body of Christ. Salvation is only found in, and here's a key word I want to jot down, salvation is only found in the body of Christ. Salvation is only found in the church of our Lord. And third here, and momentarily, we'll look at how Every human soul 
who wants to be saved, just like those folks there in Acts chapter 2 on the day, day of Pentecost, every human soul who has a desire to be saved will look at how they are to, according to the scriptures, a way which is right and not a way which just seems to be right, will look at how they can for sure be, be saved. But before we do, we want to emphasize this one more time in point number two. Okay, we said in point number one, backing up, the church, according to what Paul said, the church is the body of Christ. And according to what Paul said, Galatians or Colossians chapter one, the body of Christ is the church. Our second point, Paul said in Ephesians chapter five, that salvation is only found in the body. Well, we go back to, we refer back to point number one, and the word church and body are used interchangeably. Interchangeably. So actually, Paul was saying here in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23, that salvation is only found in the church. He is the Savior of the church. Verse 23 declares, He is the Savior of the church. He is the Savior of the body. The same, the same thing. Now, thirdly and lastly then, this morning, let's look at this. Believing this ought to be true, which it is. I mean, it's simple. It's factual. It's true. Looking at the first two points and realizing how crucial this, this is. Then thirdly, this morning... Let's look at how one gets into the church, the body of Christ, where Paul says Christ is doing the saving. Christ is doing the saving. And as a side note, and I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this because this isn't uh, the main direction of my sermon, but as we look at this particular point just for a few moments more, so far as Christ saving those in the church, Christ saving those who are in his body, that's emphatically true. Folks can come along with all of their hypothetical situations and what about this and what about that and so on and so forth and get so deep with their thoughts. All I know is Paul said, Christ is the Savior of his body. All I know is that one must be in his body slash church to be saved. That's what the New Testament clearly, clearly teaches. But what about sincerity? And what about uh, my neighbor? And what about uh, my uncle and my cousin? And they were good people, but they didn't go to church and they weren't this. And weren't. all I know is... All I know is that the Apostle Paul was inspired directly by the Holy Spirit to say that Christ is saving those in the church. Christ is saving those in his body. Now, thirdly then, and lastly, how does one, this is very important, all of this, all of these other points being true, we believe, we believe that we have preached this morning not a path, a method, a system that seems to be right, but that which we know to be right because we have looked at plain scriptures. I mean, very, very plain scriptures that have all been self-explanatory. Really, that have all been self-explanatory. So now, how does one get in the body of Christ, then, how does one get in the church? Paul said that salvation is found in the church. Salvation is found in his body. We have one more this morning in regard to the three-in-one topics today. One more verse that is so self-explanatory and that is so, so very simple to answer this Billion dollar, so to speak, question. Turn, if you would like, to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13. And here again, the Apostle Paul, using very simple language, will answer that question. 
Now, I've said that throughout this presentation that, um, you know, there's been one for 2,000 years. There's been one question, and the question is, what must I slash we do to be saved? And there's only one answer, too. There's only one right answer. Only one right answer. And Paul gives this one right answer actually in this little simple, simple verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13. Here we find that Paul says this. For by one spirit are we all, watch this, look at this. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made, all made to drink into one spirit. There it is. Very easy. Very simple. Since the church is the body, and the body is the church, since salvation is only found in the church, how do we get in the church? Paul gives us one answer. One answer. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one church. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body? So one must be scripturally, and this is another topic that we want to address this morning, and it's a fairly lengthy topic, and uh, we'll uh, preach on this sometime soon as well, so far as scriptural water baptism. But just to say here, as we look at this verse, one must be baptized into the body into the church must be in order to be to be saved in order to as folks use the term find salvation in order for folks to be saved they must be baptized into the body that's a term salvation really isn't a term that's used a whole lot i don't suppose today we hear folks that talk about to being being saved. And it's the same thing, you know, salvation being saved. But just looking at terms here for a moment, a lot of folks talk about, religious folks talk about being saved. And they'll share to us, they'll express to us how that they are saved. And that's a wonderful thing if they're truly saved. If they weren't saved by some feeling, some emotion, and so on and so forth. And if they were, they really weren't saved according to the scriptures. And if they have followed some of these many answers that's been out there for many, many, many years, if they followed an answer that is not scriptural, they really aren't saved. And that is sad. Because likely they really want to be saved. And we want them to be saved. But they must be saved according to, to the scriptures. We have one more point I want to share with you before I close this morning. But just in summation of what we've looked at here in my outline and here upon the board. The church is the body. The body is the church. Salvation is only found in the church. Christ is the head of his church, Paul says, Ephesians 5, and he is the savior of the body. And then third, Paul said there in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, that everyone, he said, we, we all, everyone, everyone who desires to truly be saved must be baptized Baptized into the family of God. Baptized into the church of Christ. Baptized into the body of Christ. Lastly, does it really matter though? I mean, really. Does it, does it really, really matter? 
It does. There might be folks who might watch this recording, and after listening to the scriptures and considering these thoughts and so on, these biblical thoughts and so forth, they still might deduct, well, this all sounds good. But they might deduct it really doesn't matter. You know, they might say, okay, that's what your church teaches, and that's fine. But my church, as they use that term, or my denomination, or my pastor, he teaches something different. So please respect that. Please respect that. They might deduct, this sounds good and so forth, but I've been taught for years by my pastor something different, and I've been taught for years, perhaps, by my parents, who are good people, and my grandparents, who are excellent people, something, something different, and I still want to stay with that, so I respect what you say, as they would Hermit, and please respect what I believe, my convictions, and, and all. So the question here is, does it really matter? Does it really matter how, and that's the question here, does it really matter how one is, is saved? One question, one answer. I don't know how many answers there are in the religious world today, but let's look at this. One question, how many answers in regard to how folks are to be saved and looking at what pastors say, what TV preachers say, what radio preachers say, what podcast preachers say, and on and on and on. I mean, just to use a figure to make a point. Could we say that uh, there are, what, uh, 25 different answers, maybe 30, maybe 100 plus? I don't know. But just to, make, just to make a point here, does it, looking at this right now, does it really, really matter? There are those that might deduct, okay, um, good sermon, good sermon, I'll give it some thought perhaps. But I still don't think that it really matters. I believe that though there's one question, obviously, I believe that all 25 answers are fine. And that God knows my heart. There it is. God knows my heart. And as long as I accept him and accept his son as my personal savior and invite him into my heart, However I do that, however I do that, they say, that's between me and God. Well, it is. It is. But it does matter. The answer, the singular answer given to us in the scriptures, it does, it does matter. All throughout the Bible, in regard to any Bible matter, all throughout scriptures, we find verse after verse after verse declaring unto us that the answer to that issue, whatever it is, does matter. It does matter. For example, in Psalm chapter 127, verse 1, a very popular verse, Psalm chapter 127, verse 1, we find the psalmist David said a long, long time ago, he advances this principle that is a blanket truth to every facet of truth, including this one, this one here. Psalm chapter 127, verse 1, David said, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Now, he's just talking about an overall blanket principle. Except the Lord build the house. Meaning, except the Lord 
through the scriptures, of course, have his hand in the matter and guide us in everything we do biblically. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. And that's sad. That's sad to know that those who are religious folks, sincere, honest folks, who are striving to be saved and striving for this and that, but when it comes to many of their doctrinal beliefs, again, they're going by a way that seems to be right. And the Bible says that the end thereof are the ways of, of death. It does matter is the point here I'm closing with. It does matter. It matters. In Matthew chapter 15, verses 13 through 14, we find that Jesus talked about plants and planting plants and advances another principle here. In Matthew chapter 15, verses 13 through 14, Jesus said here to sum up what he said. He says here, every plant that my heavenly father, and he's talking about biblical matters. He's talking about spiritual truths. Every plant that my heavenly father has not planted shall be rooted up. In Matthew chapter 15, verses 13 through 14. So it does matter. It does matter. You see, folks, we live in a society today, and it's been this way, I know, for a long, long time. But this mindset seems to be progressively getting worse. It seems in a society today that says there's no such thing as absolute truth. There's no such thing is absolute truth. <clears throat> and they say, respect my truth, <clears throat> and I'll respect your truth, but there's no such thing as absolute truth. There's no such thing as one truth anymore. And that's a growing mindset in many, many areas. In Christendom, in the world, in other matters, and it's very dangerous and it's very unscriptural, very, very much so. And so we find here in summation, so far as our last and final point here is, again, David said, except the Lord have his hand in the matter, all of our efforts then are in vain. And Jesus said that unless his heavenly Father plant the plant, it shall be rooted Rooted up principles clearly, principles clearly teaching us that it does, it does matter. How one is saved. Someone could be as sincere and honest as they possibly can be in regard to salvation, in regard to being saved. And they may, from their heart, I mean, even with tears and all, advance the question, what can I do to be saved? I want to be, I really want to be saved. How can I be saved? And they cannot be saved and will not be saved unless they follow <coughs> the one answer, the one answer given to them and to us in the scriptures. That's our presentation then for this morning. If you're here today and not a member of the church, we would invite you to become one, or if you're here this morning and you have strayed from the path of duty and the path of right and would like to make wrongs right in your life, make your wishes known, step out, step up, as we stand and sing our invitation song. <laughs>